Hello and welcome to today's video. Today we will be doing a demo of uh, how to flatten a dress. This particular dress was created in Rhino and um, has, has had a texture applied to it, so we will be doing the flattening and we'll, we will be showing how to flatten a garment and how to use Exact Flat Monarch to create uh, PDF patterns of this that can then be sent to uh, both printers and uh, plotting tables. Um, this model has already been uh, meshed and in fact it, it came in as a mesh. Uh, so when we look at the layer tree, uh, we've undergone a few different operations here. So the default layer has the original mesh that came in. This is modeled as half a dress. So we've gone ahead and we've mirrored this. We've also cut the mesh in half and uh, joined it together. Uh, the final step of the process was to apply a texture to this mesh and we've already done that. So if we turn on the remeshed layer, uh, we can see our, our final mesh here has been remeshed and has a uh, texture applied to it. So we've uh, already accomplished uh, pretty much all the preparation uh, steps required for exact flat. We've uh, used the surfaces to create a mesh. Uh, we've cleaned up the mesh. We've applied a texture to it. And we've already used the adaptive remesher to clean up the mesh. So all we're left with at this point is the flattening steps. So to, uh, to begin, we will use the exact flat flattener. So that's the very first icon in the exact flat tools toolbar. And we're just going to simply rectangle select all the meshes here. Now this particular model does have a lot of pieces on it. So instead of uh, flattening all these pieces uh, separately, what we're going to do is we're going to use the exact flat cutting tools to remove some of these cuts. So before we do any kind of uh, pattern processing, before we even use the pre-flatteners to remove our strain and sag, we're going to use the exact flat delete cut tool and we're going to remove some of these cut lines. So we can do this either on the 2D pattern, which is uh, laid out all over the place, or we can use the 3D reference model. So we're just going to select lines here and we're going to delete some of these cuts on the 3D model. So we're going to create one single piece for the front here. We're going to create a single piece for the back, top half. And what we're going to do, we're getting this tearing or flickering effect, uh, probably because we've got both the rendered mesh and the reference uh, model mesh over top. So we're going to make our model layer the default layer, and we'll turn off our rendered mesh. Now we don't have two meshes occupying the same space. So we're going to continue. We're going to remove uh, some additional cuts here. So we're going to make sure as we remove a cut on the front, we're also going to remove the same cut on the back end side. And we're just going to join some of these pieces together just so we don't have as many pieces to work with. So we've reduced our piece count just by removing some of these cuts. And now we can proceed to our, uh, our normal first step with uh, exact flat. And we can use the pre-flatteners to remove uh, a bit more of the strain and sag. So right now we're looking at our pattern in uh, rendered viewport. But if we right click on the perspective viewport title, we can change to our different uh, shading modes. So we're going to change to shaded viewport. And now we can have a look at the strain map of these different pattern pieces. So uh, with exact flats, the two stage flattener, the first stage being our, our very quick pre flatteners, and the second stage being the, the uh, optimizer. So the biggest difference uh, is the optimizer is always going to give you uh, the final optimized form. However, it does take a lot longer to operate. Whereas the first stage pre-flatteners, they are incredibly fast, but depending on the pre-flattener you use, you're always going to get a different pattern. So for this dress um, and all pattern pieces in general, uh, the best strategy is to simply try different pre-flatteners and in case of fracture, it gives the best patterns when used along planes of symmetry. So we're just going to pick different uh, edges along planes of symmetry. Uh, pelt, it uh, doesn't really matter where you choose the piece. You're always going to get more or less the same pattern. Um, but with fracture, we're using fracture because these pattern pieces are symmetrical. So we like to, we want to try to preserve the symmetrical shape of the pattern pieces. And we're also using fracture because uh, it tends to give very good results with these shapes here. In the case of these pieces here, 
just going to drag these away. And even this one up here, we do have some folds and wrinkles or flip triangles. So fracture did not work on these ones. Uh, with the pre-flatteners, we can use as many different pre-flatteners as we want, uh, as many times as we want. And in case of fracture, depending on where we click on the pattern piece, we're going to get a different pattern. So in this case, we're trying different points here to remove the folds and wrinkles, and we're just not able to remove the folds and wrinkles from this piece with fracture. So we're going to try a different pre-flatter on this one. We'll try fracture uh, from different locations on this one here. And again, I don't think we're, okay, we were able to remove all the folds and wrinkles there. So we'll try lastly again up here, and I don't think so. So we're going to try pelt instead. So we'll pelt this piece, and we've got a pattern without any folds or wrinkles. And again, over here, we've got a pattern without any folds or wrinkles. So fracture is ideal for these because the pieces are uh, fairly symmetrical. And when we use fracture on them, we get patterns with very low strain. So our primary goal for our pre-flatteners is first and foremost to remove any kinds of uh, folds or wrinkles from the pattern. So when we see uh, the cross marks here, I'll just fracture this piece again. When we see these cross marks here, these indicate folds and wrinkles. And if we zoom in even closer on this piece here, we're going to start to see inset triangles. So this is a, an area of the pattern that has folded or creased on itself. And these are patterning errors that need to be fixed. So our primary goal for the pre-flatteners is to remove these folds and wrinkles. And when uh, one pre-flattener fails to do that, we simply move on. We try a different pre-flattener. So we can uh, try Fracture or Pelt or CCM, which has three different modes. The initial mode tends to work best and give the best results. So if we reduce CCM initial on this one here, we get that kind of pattern shape. CCM initial gives this pattern for this one, and we get this shape over here. So uh, CCM initial and fracture work well on symmetrical pattern pieces, and pelt works fairly well on all of the pattern pieces. The second uh, main goal of the um, uh, pre-flatteners is to uh, reduce uh, the energy density as close to zero as possible. So when we look at the pattern pieces, we'll notice that we've got uh, different colors on them. So this one over here has uh, quite a bit of red. We've got some yellow, green, cyan, white, and we're even, going, we're even going into black. So the color shown represents the different quantities of strain uh, or uh, how much the pattern piece needs to stretch. So if we think of the 3D model, so we've got our 3D model over here. If we think of our 3D model as a rigid plastic shell, um, the amount of strain on the pattern piece indicates how much we're going to have to stretch that pattern to get it to fit back onto the rigid shell. So in the case of this piece up here, this corresponds to the top front piece here, uh, we're going to have to pull this quite a bit to get it to fit on, and that's because the pattern is too small. But this is because we've only used our first stage flattener on it, in this case uh, CCM initial. We haven't optimized these pattern pieces yet. So when we go to optimize these pieces, what exact flat's going to do is it's going to add or remove material to give the best fit possible. So before I do that, we're going to turn off our 3D reference model. So we're going to make our pattern the default layer, and we're going to turn off the light bulb to hide the 3D reference model. We're also going to double click on the perspective viewport title. This is going to minimize the viewport, and we're going to double click on top. This is going to maximize the top viewport. So this is going to make it so we have a perfect top-down view of our pattern. Now we're going to go ahead, we're going to optimize the pattern pieces, so we're going to click the spring icon, and we're just going to select all our pattern pieces and optimize them. So for this dress here, we're going to optimize as a simple cotton material. Uh, if you have a uh, material that you would like to use, uh, ExactFlat does come uh, standard with 85 different uh, sample materials. Uh, we also provide a material manager that allows you to create and add your own custom materials within ExactFlat. And we do partner up with uh, a couple different institutions uh, for a very low cost of about 25 US dollars. You can send them a sample of your own material and usually within about five business days they will return the results to you. And you can use those results uh, along with one of our guides to create your own mathematical model for your own material with, uh, for use with an exact flat. 
So we're going to use uh, the default settings here. We're just going to optimize for cotton. The only change I'm going to make is I'm going to turn off our preserved boundaries option. We'll talk a little bit more about this after we uh, optimize our pattern piece and what this uh, particular option does. So we're going to go ahead, we're going to click OK, and we're going to start to optimize. So the first thing we're going to notice as we optimize, we're going to notice that the shape and color of the different pattern pieces are changing. And this is to reflect um, the material that's being added or removed from the pattern piece. So in the case of the color changing, when it changes from red to more of a white, we're adding additional material. We're reducing the amount of strain on the pattern piece or the amount that we have to stretch or pull that pattern piece to get it to fit back onto the rigid shell. In the case of the areas where it's black, we're going to be removing material because black indicates sag or an excess of material. So we're going to be removing some of that material to allow the pattern piece to fit onto the 3D model without um, any kind of excess uh, sagging or wrinkling. So as we optimize our pattern pieces here, we've got quite a bit of information being displayed to us in the spring status dialog. And the most important uh, metric to look at is probably the average energy density. And this is uh, an indicator of how much uh, strain or the, the level of average strain across the pattern piece we have. So the closer to zero this value, uh, the closer to a perfect pattern we have. Um, another important piece of information would be to look at the maximum energy density. So this on its own uh, simply represents the single point of largest energy on the pattern. Uh, however, this value on its own isn't uh, the most useful, but uh, you can use this value if you have a very, very high uh, maximum average energy density. That's usually an indicator that you have an error in your pattern. You may have a hole or uh, an undesirable formation of triangles that may have been created uh, as an anomaly. Or you could just have, uh, uh, if there's a fold or wrinkle or flip triangle when you optimize the pattern piece, a lot of the times that's going to manifest itself as a very large maximum energy density. So on its own, the maximum energy density isn't very useful but uh, to indicate the quality of the pattern, but it is a very good indicator for errors uh, on the pattern that need to be fixed. So if you do have an error, uh, the best thing to do is to either stop the optimize or you can let it continue running, uh, fix the error, and you just optimize the pattern pieces again. So just like the pre-flatteners, uh, fracture, pelt, and CCM, we can run the optimizer as many times as we want. The, the most important thing to remember is that any change that's made to the pattern, whether we're pre-flattening or making or deleting cuts, we should always optimize the pattern afterwards to, uh, opt to give the best fit possible. So another important piece of information would be our no seam stretch error. So when we consider the 3D model, uh, the perimeter length of the 3D model and compare it to the perimeter length of the 2D pattern, because we're changing the shape of the pattern, we're adding or removing material, we're also going to be changing the perimeter length of the 2D pattern. And the no seam stretch error is the difference in pattern perimeter length between the 2D pattern and the 3D model. So this is a, a global measure around the entire perimeter of the pattern piece. So when we consider the size of some of these pattern pieces and that we're working in millimeters, um, a no seam stretch error of, uh, in this case we're just uh, finishing the optimization here, about 20 millimeters, that's 2 centimeters, that's a very, very small no seam stretch error uh, when you consider that's global around the entire perimeter. And because of the nature of the material, in this case cotton, it's a fairly stretchy material, um, that error can very easily be absorbed just through um, stretching the neighboring pattern piece. However, if you are working with a material that does not stretch, uh, such as uh, leather or metal or plywood, um, then you really want to try to reduce that no seam stretch error to as close to zero as possible. So when we started our spring uh, or our optimization, we had a look at the spring settings and we turned off the preserved boundaries option. So if we turn that preserved boundaries option on, we can specify a target for no seam stretch error. And this is an additional metric that comes into play during the optimization here. And that option is going to help to minimize this value and bring it down to the target or below. So it's not always going to bring it down to exactly the target. Most of the time it's going to reduce that value 
greater than the target, but um, it does a very good job of helping to minimize the uh, difference between the 3D model perimeter length and the 2D pattern perimeter length. So we're looking at this pattern here, and our average energy density is staying fairly constant at uh, about 2.5 newton meters. Uh, the only thing that's really changing is our uh, no seam stretch error, and it's uh, changing very slowly. So uh, in the case where pattern pieces are taking quite a while to optimize, in this case it only took us a minute and a half to optimize this piece, but a lot of the times when we observe our pattern, if it's observed to be good enough or you're just uh, trying to run a quick simulation to see how well it's going to fit, you can click the skip button to skip the current piece or you can click the stop button to stop optimizing altogether and ExactFlat's going to accept the results as is. In this case, optimization is finished, so we'll click OK and we'll uh, move on to our next step. So we're going to work with uh, first the front of the dress. So we're going to select this piece here and to arrange the pattern pieces um, we can use uh, simple Rhino commands and we can also use some of the exact cloud tools. So what we're going to do first is we're going to move this piece out to the side so we can start working with it and then we're going to rotate it using the Rhino rotate command. So we're going to choose one of the end points down here as the center of rotation and we're going to choose the same uh, point on the other side and we're just going to use this as a reference line to snap this piece so it's perfectly horizontal. So just by holding shift on my keyboard I'm going to snap my second uh, reference point so it's a, on the horizontal XY axis. Now because this piece is perfectly horizontal I can use the exact flat find tool to start finding the neighboring pattern pieces. So the find tool allows us to find neighboring pattern pieces and if I start mousing over the edge here we can see the neighboring pattern pieces being identified right down here and we can see the corresponding edge being highlighted as well. And If I select this piece it's going to move and rotate that piece so it's perfectly uh, aligned with the selection edge. Uh, we do have an optional offset so right now it's set to 5 millimeters. I'm going to change this to about 20 millimeters so we have a bit more of a gap there and when I run the tool again we can uh, refine the piece and it's going to change this to about 40 to create a bit more of a gap here. So we'll go ahead and we'll find all the neighboring pattern pieces for this for the front and then we'll go on to do the back. So what we're going to do is we're going to repeat the process. I'm just going to rotate this piece. I'm going to select my first uh, rotation center here, my first reference point here, and then I'm just going to hold shift to snap my second reference point to the horizontal x-axis. Now I can use the exact flat find tool to find and arrange all of the neighboring pattern pieces. So at this point, we've flattened our pattern, and we've been working mostly in our rendered viewport, but if we switch back to our, or sorry, our shaded viewport, but if we switch back to our rendered viewport, we can see that the uh, texture has flowed, has followed us all the way through the flattening process, and as we optimize our pattern pieces, the texture actually expands and contracts as well. So when we start comparing our pattern pieces, we can see that the texture uh, flows seamlessly all the way through, so we, we don't lose any of the texturing through the flattening process. It, it's followed all the way through. And depending on how your model was textured, if it's textured seamlessly in the 3D model, when you flatten your 2D pattern pieces, the texture is also going to be seamless all the way to the 2D pattern pieces. So from here, depending on your process, uh, we have a couple options. We can either save this file as a DXF, uh, right now for use in uh, other uh, patterning applications. So if you're using something like Gerber AccuMark or Optitex to do your patterning work, you can create a DXF and you can proceed with your normal workflow. Or you can use uh, the exact flat tools to add additional patterning information. So uh, the easiest tools to use are probably our notch tools. And when we open them up, we're presented with the, uh, the notch tag default. So we can create different types of notches with exact flat. So we have the option to choose between slit notches and V notches. We can change the color of the notch, and we can also change the text tag or the notch name that's going to be created along with this notch. So by default, um, the percent %n identifier just simply adds a unique auto-incrementing number 
So with uh, the tag that I have here, we're always going to have a unique tag. We can also specify the notch length, and in the case of V-notches, we can uh, adjust the notch width as well. When using a length of zero, the notch length is just going to automatically inherit the length of the seam that's being applied. So when we export our DXF or render to a PDF, uh, our notch is always going to travel the entire length of the seam offset. So we're going to go ahead, we're going to click the Add button, and we're going to start to add some notches. So we're going to notice that as we select one point here, a notch is also being added to the neighboring piece on the neighboring side here. So as I start adding all my notches, uh, we're automatically adding notches to both sides of the seams, which makes it very easy to add notches with exact flat. Once we've finished adding notches, we can go ahead and we can either create a DXF if we're sending this to a cutting table, and we can do this using the exact flat DXF exporter. And this tool differs from simply saving your part as a DXF in the sense that when we create a DXF using the, uh, the exact flat DXF exporter, we're creating a DXF that has both our seam line and cut line, as well as any kind of notches that we've added. If we'd add any other kind of markup to the pattern, then that information is also created in the DXF as well. So we'll go ahead, we'll create a DXF, we're just going to call it Dress. And if we import this DXF back into our Rhino workspace here, we can have a look at the DXF structures. So we'll open this up, we'll import it back in here, and we can see the DXF pattern pieces. So once we've imported this, we have uh, all the layers for the DXF in our document now. So we can see we have a grain layer, which is always going to be the horizontal x-axis, unless we've added a, a manual grain line using the exact flat grain line tool. So using this tool, we can customize the orientation of the grain line. We also have uh, our cut layer. So when we look at the pattern piece here, if we drag this one over here, it's going to correspond to this pattern piece here. The interior blue line corresponds to the natural, uh, natural perimeter of the pattern piece, and the red line is always going to be the perimeter of the pattern piece plus an optional seam allowance. So this is spe uh, set in the exact flat options panel. So um, we've got our cut line, we've got our seam line, and in the case of these pieces over here, we also have our notches that we've added. And if we zoom in, we can see the unique tags that are created. So that one is notch zero, we have notch one, and following this along, we have notch two, and so on. So all of this information is uh, placed onto separate layers. So in the case of um, bringing this into, uh, if we're sending this out to a cutter, uh, if we're using, uh, for instance, an Eastman cutter, uh, we will be importing this into Eastman Easy Cut. And at that point, we have the option to assign different tools to the different layers. So we might assign a wheel blade to the uh, cut layer. We might assign a pen tool to the seam layer. That uh, way we can help out the sewing staff by identifying where the sew lines are. Uh, we may assign a drag blade to the uh, notch layer to do the slit notches. And we may assign a pen tool or we may uh, just discard the uh, notch tag layer. Uh, if we're going into, um, for instance, the uh, AccuMark, then we can uh, control the import of the pattern using the AccuMark, AccuMark software to help identify uh, the different features of the pattern simply by uh, creating your, your proper import profile. Uh, we can also, uh, because these are textured uh, and we want to be printing these, we can also uh, render these and create PDFs uh, of the pattern using uh, our exact flat monarch tool so if we use the, the monarch render command we can now select our pattern pieces here i'm only going to select three of them and we can actually create a pdf so depending on the printer that you're using the material you're printing to you're going to want to uh, pay special attention to your resolution uh, certain materials uh, tend to bleed the ink a lot more than others, so you want to do some tests to make sure that you have the, the correct resolution set, otherwise your, your printed pattern is just going to bleed out in the material. But for this demo, we're going to render at 150 dpi. We're not going to make any kind of changes to the texture here. Um, we do have the option, we can convert the texture to grayscale or even black and white depending on what uh, Monarch is being used for. In this case, because we're printing a uh, full color image uh, as a, a garment, we're not going to make any kind of conversion to the texture. 
Lastly, we can choose which pieces of information are going to be uh, uh, added to the, the PDF. So when we create our PDF, we're going to add our cut line, we're going to add our seam line, and we're also going to add our notches and our, our notch tags to the uh, PDF as well. So we'll go ahead and we'll, um, uh, we'll click the render button and we'll render these pattern pieces here. So rendering doesn't take long, and as we render, we can see a live preview being generated and added to the document here. So we'll go ahead and remove those. And if we open up our, our PDFs, we'll have a look at uh, the structure here. So when we open up our PDF, we can see that we've got both the rendered image here, and again, this is all placed onto different layers. So we've got our print layer here that has the rendered image, we have our cut layer, which is going to be the red line, so we can assign that to a different tool depending on the hardware that you're using. You may have a combination cut or plotter, so we can assign the cut layer to a cutting uh, tool. We could assign the uh, seam layer to uh, either, we can either turn that off, ignore it, or we can assign that to a pen tool. And we've also got our notch and uh, tags layer. So our notches, again, can be assigned to a cutting tool. And depending on your needs, uh, our tags can be assigned to uh, a pen tool or they can simply be turned off. But in the case of Monarch, we have the ability to turn on and off uh, the various bits of information that are going to be placed into the DXF. So really, it's best to configure your Monarch export profile to only give you the information that you need. So thank you very much for watching.